Being at sea, in one way or another, is an experience I've had quite often during the long search, but never so utterly as when I was trying to find something out about Chinese life and Chinese religion. On no other journey have all my Western assumptions been so radically challenged. A quarter of the world's population is Chinese, 900 million in communist China, and the rest scattered over Southeast Asia and beyond. Our search took us to an island, Taiwan, non-communist. It used to be called Formosa, the beautiful island. Population, 17 million, its capital, Taipei. When you try and find out about Chinese religion, people will say that Chinese are Confucians, Taoists and Buddhists. And, here's the hiccup, they may be all three at once. Right at the start, it was my luck, the Chinese might say it was my destiny, to meet and be adopted by three good companions. They worked together on a magazine. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the next issue? The next issue won't get put out. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to manage as far as the language goes? My, my Chinese is non-existent. Well, I speak English, of course. He speaks Taiwanese and Mandarin, yeah. and he speaks Hakka and Mandarin. So yeah. between the three of us, we'll manage. Yeah, everybody speaks Mandarin, do yes. more or less. Mm -hmm. Because you speak English so well, do you feel as though you're not entirely Chinese? No, I'm very much Chinese. Linda Wu was a Fulbright scholar and studied in England and America. She's the editor. Do you speak no English at all? He's a speaking. little. A little? Enough. Enough. <laughs> Huang Yung Sung, old Huang, is the art director. Yao Ming Jia, we called him Baby Yao, is the associate art director. Why does he sleep so much? <laughs> He's so tired. Oh, tired. I need it. What? I need it. You need it. Oh, great. In our growing. Their magazine is in English and is called Echo, Echo of Things Chinese. The first thing you notice when you come into their office is the emblem on the wall, the familiar Chinese yin and yang. How should I look at like this? Well, in the beginning there was nothing, there was chaos. All right, and then in, ca in, in, in the midst of chaos, the yin and the yang developed. All right, and then from the yin yang, the four directions, and from the four directions, the eight trigrams. I better get that straight. Chaos, first of all, yes. represented by the black. Then that emerges into this sort of balance. Right. It? The yin and the yang. The Chinese, in talking about the origin of things, don't speak of creation or a creator god. For them, it seems, there is what you might call undifferentiated potential. Linda calls it chaos, emerging into two complementary principles, the yin and the yang. Day and night. Day and night. Okay, that's the beginning. That's the, that is... Men and women. Yeah. Birth and death. Birth and death. And... And two seasons. Two seasons. And the seasons. Summer. Winter. Summer, winter. Yeah. That's a, just a simple way of beginning. Very good. Yeah. Well, well I, I've got to start somewhere, so I may as well start there. The great shock to the system for anyone in our tradition is to learn that for the Chinese, good and evil are not opposites in the sense of yin and yang. You don't say yin is good, yang is bad, or vice versa. If you must use the words, a balance of yin and yang is good, imbalance is evil. 
Two and a half thousand years ago, the sage Confucius wrote these words. Is there anything more excellent in the world than to celebrate the festival of the god of earth and the springtime? Our first outing was to a village called Meinung on the birthday of the local earth god, the Tudigung. The idea was to start with the gods of the people and leave the philosophy for later. The earth god shrine was under a tree, on a hill, by a river. Well, most, uh, most earth god temples are. Oh, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah. It's nice and sort of water. And it's a bit like a grave shape. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the <laughs> do that mm. yeah, they yes well do. they they always do this for uh, as, a, as part of the celebrations for the for the great god's birthday do you have a lot of heart attacks uh, no <laughs> <laughs> i just get very scared uh tuti kung is it three words yes it is what do they mean well tuti itself means earth and gong means god no, i haven't got that how we sorry to tu? tuti means earth Earth, I see, right. and Kong is... Kong is uh, a respectful term that we call God. Earth God. Is he a very important oh. deity? Well, the Chinese, um, in Chinese folk tradition, all the gods are um, uh, organized in sort of a hierarchy. And he's, he's in, and the hierarchy is equivalent to, uh, to the human uh, bureaucracy in Imperial China. Well, you mean that the gods are parallel somehow right. to, um, to so the... To the bureaucracy of real magistrates real and kings. Magistrates, and right. All that. So that, uh, and on the top you would have uh, the Jade Emperor, which would be the supernatural counterpart of the Emperor. And the Tudigong would be on the bottom, whereby he would be the counterpart of a village chieftain, let's say. Because he's really the god of a locality. Oh, I see. So he's very much your local man. I mean, yes. he doesn't do for the next village. No, no, no. He he's, the, he's the official of this village. Ah, and what sort of problems do you bring him? Well, he sort of acts as a police in a sense that he he polices the area for ghosts who are really in a sense beg equivalents of beggars and bandits, and then he also looks after the welfare of the community, agriculture, um, whether there are many births, weddings, deaths, and things, so that people come ah. and report these things to him. So you mean that, like uh, an ordinary policeman, might be responsible for, say, rushing somebody to hospital? Yes. or driving off a beggar, or catching a thief. Mm -hmm. Tutti Kung in some way does this with um, non-human right. agents. Oh, on the non-human level, on the supernatural level. Oh, I see. There's another thing I discovered. If the Tutti Kung doesn't do his job properly, someone, say the mayor of the town, can dismiss him and appoint another. There seems to be no question of, uh, of the gods telling the human beings what to do. It's the human beings telling the gods what to do. Well, there's obligations on both sides. Let's say the human beings will make offerings or will worship the god as long as he's efficacious. But there's none of that business of worshipping a god for a long time who doesn't bring you actual presents. Oh, no. <laughs> you give him presents, he gives you, gives right, you presents. Right, And you worship him as long as he's efficacious. As long as he works, and as long as he put the, does his part. It was significant, I think, that the first bit of what you'd call religion I encountered had nothing to do with any form of Chinese almighty. It was a local matter, the equivalent of a policeman on the beat. In the words of a scholar I met, no one has yet managed to convince the Chinese people that China is anything but a big idea. The living unit, as they see it, is the village, the community, the family. And a great deal of their effort, because they're practical people, goes into keeping the small group harmonious. This shop deals in traditional Chinese medicine, 
Western medicine exists alongside, but hasn't ousted it. The patient, you could say, is in some state of imbalance. The balance of yin and yang in the cure will restore the balance of yin and yang in the body. I think we in the West define religion in a particular way. There has to be a God, he has to be the one God. Worshipping the one God means religion. But when I've asked in Taiwan about Chinese religion, I've often been steered towards people doing quite simple domestic things. Placing an incense stick in a pot, paying respects to an elder, balancing the flavours in cooking, Sighting a grave or a house harmoniously, choosing the right moment to start off on a journey, clearing a space, handling objects, bowing. Perhaps it's a matter of definitions. Perhaps we define religion in a way that makes us unable to see it in China. In a town not far from Tainan, the old capital of Taiwan, they're building a vast new extension to an old temple. Work started in 1970, is planned to take 12 years, and the cost will be around three quarters of a million pounds. Now surely, I thought, this will be either Confucian or Taoist or Buddhist. Not at all. There's a presiding local god in this particular temple, but he hasn't jealously displaced all the other gods. Right. Who, who, who pays for all this? The community does. The whole community. In fact, uh, a temple is always rebuilt about 70 or 80 years. And so that if the God's doing his job, then the community will be, will, will be very prosperous and they'll have money left over to build the temple. Oh, I see. So if you see a rich temple going up, you know that that community is saying we've earned enough to plough it back and to thank the God who gave us the money. Right. And, and the, uh, the people are more than willing to pay, you know, to contribute to the building of a new temple. Because oh, yeah. uh, it's sort of their token of their appreciation. And it's also to ensure the God's protection in the future. The well, is there the any feeling here that if you've got a good old temple, you jolly well keep it because it's old? No. It's like a human being. If you, your house is, uh, you, you've lived in it for 20, 30 years, and it's about time you want, you know, you want a new house. You want a bigger house than that. So the God is moving up in the world in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I suddenly thought, passing through that temple, about the great European cathedrals and how they were built. There too, there must have been rows of apprentices working to the master sculptor the master painter, and the master mason. That's, is that a, that's a television set? I yes, think. it is. What has it been? Oh, well, the television was donated by one of the faithfuls for the god. So that he can watch television. So that he could watch television, right. <laughs> you know, most, <laughs> most, most operas are, are performed for the gods. Oh, really? So right. The stage is always directly in front of the, the shrine. You mean that all uh, the opera, like the Taiwan opera, for instance, is always performed for the gods primarily? Mm -hmm. So modern entertainment, too, should yes, be provided for the gods. Mm -hmm. Do they ever turn it on? Yes, when the programs are on. But of course, human beings can also, uh, also watch. These are the gods of longevity, prosperity and posterity, embodying the great Chinese aspirations to live a long time, to make enough money and to have children.
In case your impulse, like mine, is to go on asking, is this Buddhist? Is it Taoist? Let me give you the answer I often got. It's a community temple. Buddhist deities, local deities, Taoist deities are all lodged in one place. What's happening here in a back room of the temple is a kind of seance. The father of a family has recently died. That in itself tears a hole in the community. Now there's some further disturbance and his family has come to seek the dead man's advice. The chairholders go into trance. The medium, who has already made his interior journey to another world, becomes the spokesman for a powerful god. The master of ceremonies notes what he says and waits for the dead man to speak. When the moment is ripe, the dead man, to whom offerings have been made, and who sits there in a paper effigy, makes himself felt. The priest interprets the characters traced on the tabletop. The dead man asks for the family to join together in a series of offerings. Harmony can be restored. The medium unplugs himself by leaping in the air. The more commonplace method of seeking guidance is by presenting yourself at the shrine of a god and throwing these oracle blocks. At its simplest, you ask a question and the throw of the blocks gives a yes or no answer. You could see it as just abandoning yourself to chance. Or is it a way of acknowledging the existence of more than meets the eye and laying yourself open to it? If I'd been walking round these temples by myself, I don't think I could have made the connection between the god statues, the TV sets, the seances, and the needs of a living Chinese community. But Linda bows to her gods, throws her blocks, and at the same time, by being who she is, she somehow demonstrates, if it doesn't sound too grand, a sense of the holy, another way of experiencing reality that seems to mark what we call religion wherever it's found. The majority of the popular gods I saw in Chinese temples had once been people. This was a notion quite new to me and something it took time to grasp. Any sensible Chinese, it appears, will hope for long life, enough money and pious descendants. No one wants to be a god. But there are calamities, suicides, girls die unmarried and it's somewhere in the disappointment of these lives that it's said you find God material. After death, disturbances happen. 
disturbances spread. It's like a haunting. And an ancient Chinese way to settle and deal with a dangerous, unfulfilled spirit is to start a cult for it, make it a god, so that the negative and frustrated forces loose in the air can be balanced by the positive forces of piety and worship. This is the temple of Ma Tzu in Tainan. Busloads of pilgrims come here daily, sometimes carrying their local Ma Tzu statues for what seems like a spiritual recharge. Ma Tzu was a fisherman's daughter, a virgin of great gifts and piety, who did miracles, died young, and during four centuries was promoted until in the 17th century, the emperor raised her to the rank of Queen of Heaven. This is her palace. While we were walking among the pilgrims, Linda showed me a series of wall paintings, which tell of a legendary meeting of opposites, well over 2,000 years ago. This is Kung Fu Tzu. Master Kung, whom we know in the West as Confucius. And this is Lao Tzu, the old man, the sage whom the Taoists revere. It's almost like Yang meeting Yin. They lived through a time of upheaval and each offered his answer to chaos. From Confucius, the way of the Yang. Firm government, law and order, respect for authority. From Lao Tzu, the way of the yin, the natural way, the water's way, yielding, absorbing, and a leaning to something called actionless action. But I'd come to Taiwan with the idea of three religions, Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism. Where does Buddhism fit in? Not, I was told, on this axis of yin and yang. China, from what I can gather, was hospitable to missionary Buddhism, but its primal balance was never affected. What's the story behind this one? Oh, that's a, a Taoist, a Buddhist monk, and a Confucian scholar. Yeah. And the three were really good friends. And they had spent a really in, an enjoyable afternoon together. And then when it came time for the two to leave, the host insisted on accompanying them a bit of a way. But they had such an enjoyable discussion. I mean, there was, there was had such an interesting discussion, they forgot everything else. And so that when they suddenly realized that they were almost to the other's home, that they burst out in laughter. Oh, I see. And that's the moment they catch. Right. That's lovely. And the story is usually used to show the harmony between Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. You can argue and come from different angles, but be friends. Right. It's a good lesson. And what is Confucianism? I imagine if it derives from Confucius, from the Yang principle, from ideas of firm government, it must have something to do with law and order.